up to the mic uh, while, <laughs> while I do some announcement. Okay, thank you for making it to uh, Common Ground Bukit Bintang, what a lovely place. Uh, let's give a hand to Common Ground Bukit Bintang. Are you going to move around? Oh, are you going to move uh, around a lot? Oh, you're going to be a station. Of course, the snacks. I think I really will just move around. Okay, just put this into your pocket. Uh, clip it to your forehead. Alright, yes. so... Um, uh, don't worry, I can yeah, so Common Ground Bukit Bintang has graciously hosted, hosting us and also providing the food, which usually doesn't happen uh, unless you pay them a lot of money. So, thank you to Steven for pulling some strings. Uh, so, first up, we will have. Oh, by the way, uh, housekeeping. So, um, bathrooms are outside. Just go back to the elevators and you'll see it. Um, I think that's about all the housekeeping we need. Okay, first speaker we have uh, Sujono. So, Sujono is a senior front end engineer at Hong Kong Bank. Um, You'll be speaking on Angular at scale. I presume Hong Kong Bank uses Angular at scale. So, how do you develop Angular application in a scalable way? You need NGRX, and you'll be touching on Angular for enterprise teams. So, Sujana is actually a very, uh, he's a moderator and speaker at Facebook Developer Circle in Jakarta. Uh, he's also a technical writer for a website called codeburst.io. And uh, let's Put our hands together to welcome Sujono. So can I? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so today, uh, ah, yeah. two seconds. Okay. while we wait for warm up. Um, there's some space in the front. Anyone wants to sit here? VIP seats? All right, are ready. Okay, thank you. What is that? Uh, another HTML. Oh, another HTML. Okay, sorry, there was a technical issue. Uh, so today I will bring a, I will give a talk about Angular at scale. So this is from our experience uh, in Hong Kong Bank. So who am I? Yeah, my name is Jona. I am Indonesian. So yeah, even though I'm look, uh, I'm Indonesian Chinese and just moved to here from five months ago. So I worked in Jakarta before for three years in Sandit and GDP Labs. Uh, the Sandit is a payment gateway company, and GDP Labs is one of the IT investment company under Jarum, the one of the biggest company in Indonesia. And 
uh, <coughs> in community, I also contributing in the Facebook Developer Circle Jakarta as a trainer, moderator, volunteer, and speaker. Yeah, so many things. And I also bring a bring a talk uh, last year in Jakarta JS. It's same with the Kuala Lumpur JS. So for every month, they have monthly meetup to learn about the JavaScript and those kind of things. Uh, I also publish two articles until now in the Codebars.io. It's a medium publisher. It's same with Hacker Noon and Git Connected. So I publish my article to them and they will republish and reshare my article to other people that subscribe to the medium. And just uh, five months ago, I also participated in the Facebook Hackathon uh, 2018 in F8, uh, San Jose, California. So yeah, I think that's all. <clears throat> yeah, so this is uh, all of the concept that I will talk today is come from our experience. So I decide to bring the experience that I faced before in this talk and this concept also apply in your phone. I think this concept are general. So you can also apply the same thing in your front end development, regardless of the framework that you choose or library that you choose. So it doesn't matter that you use React or Angular or Foo. I think you can still use this concept. Okay, so what is a scalable way? So uh, two months ago, when when we get a project, uh, we just we just have four people back then. So from my my first priority is to create a project that can be a foundation for the other project. So I learned that uh, from Ken Seeders. It's Ken Seeders is a uh, he is a React guy and a GD also. So he proposed four testing that can make your project testable and scalable. First is static. This is the basic. So you have to finish from the bottom to the top. Static and then unit testing, integration testing, and end-to-end -end testing. I think all of you have ever heard about this, but uh, this is from our experience, uh, so I think we, I want to share uh, my experience in here about the static unit and the end-to-end -end test. So, if you use Angular, you know that they already use TypeScript before, either TypeScript or Dart. You can choose either TypeScript or Dart in that, uh, in developing the Angular, and usually people will use, will use TypeScript because uh, there are so many uh, concepts from object-oriented programming that can be used in TypeScript, like classes, interface, and abstract class. And we use this to predefine our model. For example, when we do the API request, that we can uh, define our model uh, as a contract. So the data that is coming from the API, we define, we, define that, we define that as a model. But is that good enough for the last project? So, I think uh, TypeScript is good. I mean, the static typing is the basic or maybe the most important for developing uh, less typo and less buggy project. But the first thing that you have to think is the style guide. This is the, uh, this is the most important one because everyone can do the development in their own way. So what is the style guide? It means that you only have one guide to develop your project, either in the code formatting and then uh, code structure and those kind of things. So what is the purpose? The purpose is to is uh, to make a faster and easier onboarding process. Imagine that uh, there is a new developer that come to your they come into your team and want to learn about the Angular. You just put this official this style guide and they will learn maybe for one or two days, and they can jump it to the project. And the second advantage is the same code standard across all developers. Oops, yeah. So what is the style guide that we use in Hong Leong? So we use the Angular official guide. Uh, do you guys know John Papa? No, 
So yeah, okay, that is the angular guy. Okay, so John Papa is one of the <coughs> contributor from Angular One, or you can call it Angular JS, that still use the dollar scope or maybe uh, dollar root scope that uh, develop the style guide for the Angular project. He developed the style guide from the Angular One until now the Angular Six. So for all of you that doesn't know about the Angular version. Actually, there are only two Angular, Angular JS and Angular. So the Angular JS is the old Angular, the Angular one, and the Angular is the latest Angular. So when people call it Angular two, four, five, six, it's just a semantic version. It's just a version on the GitHub. So he creates the Angular target, and this target is very, very complete. I think from I have learn React and, and learn Angular, from all style guide that I have read through, this is one of the style guide that maybe is the best solution to uh, make a standardization in Angular. So, for example, I think you, I think for React guys, you know, the, you know about the concept for dumb and smart component, right? Or container and uh, common component. So, in Angular, we also have that concept. Uh, wait. Okay, we also have that same concept, but we call it the shared module and the uh, page module. So the shared module is the I think you can see on the on the description declare components, directives, and type. Yeah, we have directive and type which is not which are not appear in uh, React. In a shared module, when those items will be reused and referenced by the component declared in other feature modules, for example, button and then drop down. So I have uh, I have a sample project. So if you see, I have a shared module in here, and the shared module have a dumb component, have three dumb components. Chart component, list component, and navbar nav component. And they also have a concept like core. What is core module? Is a module that will be inject one only one time in your project. For example, you want to use the RESTful API service that you can create your own Angular surface and then put it to the core module and the core module will be inject to the app module. So they they explain uh, all of the I mean almost all of the possibility that can be uh, happen in the Angular project. And then we move to the upper level. Write your own unit test. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the unit test is also called a developer's step. So you, if you create your module, then you have to write your own unit test. Yes, uh, we don't do the test-driven development. Uh, it's very hardcore, writing. <laughs> but uh, we write our own unit test, and uh, I think it's very good right now. The code coverage is more than 90%, and I think it's already testable. And we do uh, some refactoring. After we do, after we write your, our own unit test, and it's normal. And if you write your own unit test, you also uh, my our preference is the headless form. So usually, the Angular or the React project will have the Phantom JS instead of it to run the unit test, but we use headless form, uh, and it's very fast. So I recommend this uh, headless browser. And after you write your own unit test, you can do the end-to-end -end test. You can choose either Cypress or Protector. What is the difference? For the Cypress, uh, it's independent library to do the end-to-end -end test. So uh, it's like web driver, but much faster, and the syntax is easier to learn. And for the Protector, it's Angular end-to-end -end library. So you can get your ng model or uh, directive in the angular element using the protector but but it's used for the end to end test and for the performance 
So no matter what technology that you choose, you have to check your performance in general. And I think, yeah, this is applied for all front end development. So uh, for now, we use a performance budget by using Angular CLI. So in the Angular, uh, we have a performance budget. So we can set a threshold, name warning and error. So for every bundle that has a size more than the three, then more than the warning or error result, it will appear on the CLI. And we use the Webpack bundle analyzer. Who knows about this? Yeah, the Webpack bundle analyzer is very good. So uh, if you see, if you oh sorry, this is the NPM. What's the purpose of Webpack Bundle Analyzer? So we use this to inspect all of the bundle that we create before using the NPM run build. So uh, we can check uh, which bundle that has um, that has big size. And also maybe uh, weird and unexpected library. For example, uh, if you see, there is a lot of in here. If you if you see if you saw through the if you saw through the Lodas comments, they will they will uh, give you a suggestion to don't put Lodas directly inside your uh, node modules and your bundle because it will make the bundle size. Uh, it will increase the bundle size uh, bigger, and it's the the bigger the bigger means it's very big. <laughs> so that's the problem. And yeah, we use this to inspect uh, all of the bundle that we create before using npm by using npm rambut. And how to decrease the bundle size? So we use the road based code splitting. I think uh, you guys know about this. So we have the app routing in here and we have the lot children attribute. So the lot children attribute is used for the code splitting. So when user don't uh, access the home module, sorry, don't access the home page, the home module will not be loaded. So it's it maybe in React you can call it the lazy load. Yeah. So this is the this is our script in the package JSON. So we have our own lin. Uh, I think yeah that one the ng lin, and we use fix to fix the simple mistake in the code by using the ts lin, and we have our own unit test script in here the ng test with the headless Chrome browser. And then we don't use the what's mode and we use and we generate the code coverage report and we put it on the Jenkins artifact. Uh, sorry, not artifact, we put it on the Jenkins code coverage report. And uh, we in the production boot, we use the boot with the prod flag. So if we add the prod flag, it will generate the production boot with the AOT compilation. You know, A AOT. Uh, so usually, if you use if you use JavaScript, they will use the JIT compiler. But uh, the JIT has a weakness because they will compile just in time. So when the script is loaded, they will compile uh, at that time. I mean, they will compile after that. So it will have a. I will. It will have a performance issue in the browser. But maybe if your script is small, uh, it doesn't have any major effect. But we we want to use the production, we want to use the AOT compilation, so we use the prod flag. And the boot of the optimizer, so from Angular website, they said that they can reduce 10 until 50% of the bundle size using the boot optimizer. And the stats.json, uh, the stats.json flag is used to, sorry, 
the stats.json flag is used to generate the stats.json in here. And we can use the webpack bundle analyzer to inspect the to, to inspect the bundle step in here. And we do, I mean we put the linter and the testing process in the prepost script. So for every developer that want to push your code in the development branch or in the in your branch, they have to pass the linter and the testing as well. Before be, if they don't pass that the linter and the testing that they cannot push. We well, we already have the prepost flag in there, and we also have uh, this process in the Jenkins boot job. Yeah. Yeah. Ten minutes. Okay. Oh, so fast. Okay. So do we need ngrx? So uh, for Everyone that knows about state management, ngrx, uh, NGRX is uh, the state management in Angular. is is the is the factor state management in Angular. So we you can use Redux, you can use Mopex in Angular, but usually people will use ngrx. Why they use that? Why do they use uh, ngrx? Because the Angular support ngrx from start. Sorry, the Angular support RxJS from start. If you if you guys don't know about the RxJS, it's a reactive programming library in JavaScript. So, and the concept that is the concept that ngrx use is same with the Redux. And yeah, you know that Redux is very good for global state management, handling the state effect and tracking the application state. But do we need ngrx? That's the question. It's same with do you need Redux? Yeah, it's same with that question. So this is the flow of the ngrx. If you have used Redux before, it's similar. You have the action, you have the reducer, you have the state action and the effect. The effect is to handling the set effect. Like you want to do the API request in your uh, reducer. So that is a good abstraction. and I think uh, with the ngrx, you can handle, I mean, you can track your bug easily because for every step, they will be tracked in the Redux dev tools. But the problem is, the good abstraction will come with the cost, and the cost is the boilerplate. So, if you see the if you see my code, sorry, if you see my project in here, uh, sorry. So I have created the simple project. So how many boilerplate that you need to create a ngrx flow you need at least five oh sorry yeah uh, four files action effect index index is uh, sorry index is not used oh it's used for the initial set action effect index and reducer that is if it's only for one purpose but you have to create four files and if you see this is the boilerplate. You have to use the switch case, return, 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 default break, and so on. So, if you saw my example, actually it's a very simple. It's just a simple dashboard with a grab. And then I can drag and drop the grab. And if you see, when I click the close button in here, then the then the chat will be removed. So I use ngrx to communicate between that component, the list component, and the grab comp and the chat component. But for only that purpose, we need to create four files. So if you only want to store the data that can be used across components, you can use simple Angular surface. It's good enough. You not you don't need to. I mean. If you have a complex application, that maybe NGRX is the answer. 
But you only, if you only want to use the global shared data, then just use the simple service that can be inject through all components. So our case in Hongyong is a multi-step registration. So you have to pass this step first and then go to the second step and so on and so on, and so on until finish. So, and you can go back to the previous step and see your data that is pre-filled before. So, we create a simple service named shared data. And how to use it is very simple. Just inject it through the constructor and then set data and the get data. And put your key inside there. And this, set, and this shared data can be used across all of the components and all pages in your Angular application. So, this is the abstraction that we create. Yeah, uh, so after we create a project that uh, that we want to make this as a baseline or as a standard for all projects that come in the future, we think about the consistency and also the reusability across all projects. So yeah, you know guys, bank, uh, sorry, bank have same logic in every application for IC, for phone number, for email. So that logic is always repeatable. For every project, the logic is same. So we talk about handling consistency and reusability across all projects. So after searching through all of the uh, concept in the Angular, we found the NRWL NX. So what is this? I think I will give you the video. So this is the open source. NX is an open source tool for enterprise Angular applications. NX is designed to help you create and build enterprise grade Angular applications, allowing you and your teams to iterate at high velocity, architect consistently, and implement reliably. NX builds upon the awesomeness of the Angular CLI, providing a way to create what we call NX workspaces. An NX workspace is an Angular CLI workspace configured to support multiple Angular applications and libraries, essentially turning an Angular CLI repo into a mono repo. Creating a new NX workspace can be done by installing the Angular CLI and the Narwhal schematic globally then using the ng-new command to create the workspace and passing in the collection option value of at nrwl slash connect. An NX workspace has a folder for app and a folder for lib, as well as all the Angular CLI bits. The app folder will be the home for the different Angular applications you will have. How many the lib special? folder will be the home for the code that powers your application giving you a pattern for modular code reuse across your application. NX comes with a set of schematics for code generation, and an NX workspace is configured to use those schematics. Running ng space generate, or ng space g for short, with the dash dash help flag, shows you the list of available schematics. Adding a new app to the NX workspace is easy. From the terminal, you can type ng space g space app. Give it the name you want to use for the app and run that. And it will create a new Angular application and configure the Angular CLI for you. Adding new Angular lib is just as easy. Run ng space g space lib with the name of your lib and it will create a new Angular lib complete with an ng module class. And these libs get configured in the Angular CLI as projects. That means you can use the different Angular CLI schematics to generate components in your Angular lib by using the project name option and setting that to the name of your lib. And with the export option flag on, you can create reusable components. So you can use the create, you can create a reusable component in here, and you can assign that reusable component uh, as a with a tag, so it can be used to building out your application yeah. domain. Of course. Yeah, NX sorry. also helps you write schematics to your lib, CLI, and set up app 
port option flag on, you can. Okay. Yeah. So if you see, we can create a lips that can be used across all components. Uh, sorry, across all apps. Or you can only want to share this specific lip in some app with a tag. To create reusable, also helps you write your applications in a consistent way. For instance, NX comes with a generator that makes implementing NDRF a breeze. You can run ng space g space NDRF and the dash dash root flag and test and will update the targeting module with the bits needed to wire up NDRF. NX makes it easy to implement NDRF quick and in a consistent pattern. And when you need to handle data persistence in a reliable manner and work that into your NDRX implementation, NX has it covered. NX comes with a data persistence class designed to work with NDRX effects that you can import and use that provides patterns for handling data fetching as well as optimistic and pessimistic updates. And NX is packed with even more goodies like lint checks. Okay, so in short, the NX is the C, the tools that is uh, created by the NRWL to create a multi-project architecture with a monorepo approach. So we think that the monorepo is a good thing, I mean it's a good architecture, good architecture to manage multiple projects because they use the same package JSON. It means that you can you have to use the same Angular version for all projects. So and this NX is created by Victor Safkin and Jeff Cross. So Victor Safkin uh, is one of the Google developer that created Angular to author before. And Jeff Cross is one of the engineer that contribute a lot in the Angular since AngularJS. So we think that this NX uh, is a good approach to manage the multiple projects that will come in the future. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so in summary, uh, there are no silver bullet. So, choose the right weapon. Choose the right weapon for your problem. And last but not least, please update your readme. Yeah, this is very important because uh, every engineer that will clone your project have to go through your readme first. Yeah, that's all. Thanks. You mentioned that the monorepo approach is a good architecture for building uh, multi web apps. Mm. So it's the, the same for that. Why is that so? Okay. Why can't you, for example, apply this RC yeah. and then use the have shared components across the organization? Yeah, correct. So uh, there are one developers that asked me before uh, with the same question in our team. So uh, a monorepo has a advantages and disadvantages. Advantages is uh, the package JSON, because, sorry, because they use the same package JSON. So we don't only want to make a shared component or shared library, but we can, uh, we can make the consistency for the dependencies same across all the projects. But it gives the down effect, and the down effect is for the DevOps. Because they have to create, uh, I mean, they have to create a specific path for all project that uh, is created in the, for the new project that is created in the monorepo. But if you guys know, the big company also use the monorepo approach. So uh, yeah, it it depends on you if you want if you want to use this multi-repo, it's okay, and you can use bit to make a share component or share library, but we choose this, these tools because not only for the share component purpose, but also for the consistency. And they have the grab to check the dependencies across all projects. That is the tools that we think the, the we think that the important feature from them. Last one, Jason. Yeah, uh, all right, let's give a hand to uh, Very good. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, go home to get 
Okay, hello everyone. So I'm Jessie. So uh, if you're interested in Angular, how many of you is using Angular in oh, your so, so project? Okay. okay. So, um, so okay. I see some of the people that are using Angular, but I know they are using. So, <coughs> so if you're interested, there's an Angular Manager Facebook group which you can join. Then okay. you can ask questions and sometimes okay, okay. I'll make, I'll make my volume up. There as well. And um, I'm an Angular Google developer expert. So um, if you have any questions or any feedback on Angular, you can let me know. Then yeah, I can also talk to the team. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we have Mohammad Gorhom. He's a software engineer at Astro. And he'll be speaking on a clean architecture for React and React Native. Please welcome him one more time. Hi everyone. Uh, today, as is pointed here, we're going to talk about uh, clean React. Uh, it's basically an approach to implement clean architecture for uh, React and React Native projects. So uh, let's start with the agenda for today. Uh, first, we're going to have some uh, little bit of an introduction and a background. And then I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the, the clean architecture. Of course, it's going to be summarized. And then about the approach uh, that we, we've done in Astro to implement uh, clean architecture in React. And then we have uh, playground time, uh, which is playing with the code. So let's get started. <clears throat> First, uh, my name is Mohammed Gurhum, software engineer at Astro. Uh, I've uh, joined Astro last, uh, last year, uh, handled a lot of projects from uh, web to the mobile, uh, Android, iOS, and then finally we ended up with uh, React Native and React. So a little bit of background of my tech journey here. First, I started with uh, .NET, and then I moved to PHP Laravel, and then moved back to Java, Android, and then Swift for iOS, and then uh, JavaScript, which is TypeScript. So the motive. Uh, before I started with, uh, with React Native, uh, I've been assigned to uh, develop a new application in Astro, which is was, uh, let's call it application A. Uh, application A has to be in iOS and Android at the same time. With the uh, developers of eight, all mobile developers, uh, I've decided to take a new approach, uh, a new programming language to start the project with. So I've, I've looked at Flutter at first, but uh, at that time it was at the very early beta release, alpha release. So I just ended up with React Native. It wasn't a bad choice. So, uh, but coming from a mobile perspective, um, coming to React, coming to JavaScript or TypeScript in general, there is no clean um, architecture to follow. For example, uh, I'm coming from PHP Laravel. In Laravel, we have MVC, which is cleared and documented very well, and it was easy to implement. Um, Android, uh, we have the clean architecture, Android clean architecture. We have MVB and we have MVVM. iOS, which is the most cleanest for me, was uh, we have Viber, we have Clean Swift, we have MVC, and then MVVM. When I started with JavaScript, I started first at JavaScript. Um, I started with all boilerplate and starter. And every one of them is totally different than the others. So like at this point, I said, OK, it's time to try to implement the clean architecture. And that's why I'm here today to talk about our experience uh, implementing it. Disclaimer. <clears throat> The approach is a result of uh, research I've done on uh, clean architecture in, for JavaScript or for Node.js. Um, and all I did is simplify it and apply it for React and React Native. Uh, there will be some flaws or mistakes of definitions or applying the principles of clean architectures. Feedbacks are welcome. So the clean architecture. 
Uh, I think all of us have seen this uh, diagram. Uh, that's the first image you can see the moment you type clean architecture in Google. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try to uh, simplify the definitions and the layers. So let's get started. The first question is, what is it? So clean architecture is a high level guideline for creating a layered architectures using solid principles. That's the simple definition you can get. And why it was created? It was created to separate stable business rules, uh, the higher level abstractions from technical details, uh, the lower level details, defining clear boundaries. We will talk about it later. And how? Well, the main building block is dependency rule. And the dependency rule is uh, the source code must uh, the source code must point uh, inward must point inward uh, toward high level policies. So here we have the dependency rule. As you can see, uh, this is uh, we, this is those are the layers that we have in clean architecture. Uh, I will explain to, uh, later each of them. But uh, we have basically uh, we have the core, which is the entities. And then we have use cases, interactors, and then it goes further, further from the, the core, the presenters, the gateways, UI, and data sources. So to simplify the clean architecture, you can divide them into three uh, blocks. So number one is going to be the presentation layer, which is going to be the UI and the presenter. Uh, the domain layer, that's, and the data layer. So Let's start with the layers. Entities uh, represent your domain object. It's simple. It's just the models that business rules will follow. Sometimes the entities will have some logic in them, which will only be related to the entity itself. For example, we have uh, here an example, validate format uh, the user for number. So that function can be in the entity because it's related to the entity itself. Uh, use cases or uh, interactors uh, represent your business actions. Pure business logic. It's only plain code. No, no frameworks uh, at all. Maybe, maybe you can use some utils or helpers fun functionalities in them. Uh, the use cases does not know where they've been triggered from or how the data they're going to be represented. All they know is they've been uh, triggered and they will pass the data uh, around. The gateways, the gateways will retrieve and store that data from two multiple sources. For example, we may have one gateway, uh, we can call it content gateway. That content gateway can get the data from remote or a local source. And then we have the external interfaces and frameworks. Here you can add whatever you want because it's already at the very higher level, so it's not affecting the core of the, your architecture. So here I have a, an example uh, how it works. So for example, we have the UI. The UI will call a method from the presenter or the view model. The view model or the, uh, the presenter will execute the use case. The use case will combine data from the gateways the gateways will return data from the data providers and then uh, go back all the way to the UI. So the diagram, it works like this. So we have the view, we have the presenter or the view model, we have the interactor, and then it goes to the gateway. The gateway implements multiple data sources. So we have, let's say, if you implement a network layer or if you imp implement database layer. Or local storage, and then to the entity uh, uh, implement the entities. Okay, I, I think that's it for the clean architecture. Um, all the resources uh, you can get them from the slides. Later, I'll share to you. So now let's talk about the clean architecture. Uh, sorry, <laughs> React, uh, clean React. So uh, simple definition. It's uh, just uh, an ankle pop clean architecture applied to React and React Native, as simple as that. Uh, 
if you remember the data flow diagram for the clean architecture, it was like this. So in order to make it work in React and React Native, we had, we had to modify some stuff. First of all, we had the view. So for us, view in React, we called it dump component. And then we had the presenter or the view model in React, Native, uh, in React uh, we can call it the smart component. And then we need, we need something to think like React, you need something to trigger the re-render. So of course, we need to implement the state management. So the state management will be the, the new layer that we introduce to the clean architectures layers. So it's going to be the glue between the smart components and the use case interactor. So yeah, here is the adapter or state management. It, it's basically just glue the presenter, the smart component to the use case. You can implement uh, Redux, Flux, or Mobix. Coding time. Uh, before we start, uh, here's the text stack that I used in the project. Type script. I hope everyone can. Uh, and Versify GS for dependency injection. And then we have Mobix state tree for the state management and React and React Native. So let's get started. Okay. So as you can see here, the project structure we have data, domain, and presentation. Um, maybe uh, before I start explaining the code, let's go to the example and see how it works. So this is the example. The example is simple. It's just uh, a blog. A blog. Uh, you have here some posts. Uh, just you generate a random post. It uh, send it uh, online, and then the moment you tap on any of them, it will load it. A simple functionalities. So how to implement this? So we have. Let's start from the very uh, core layer, which is the domain. So we have the entities. We have one entity called post. The post is going to be in the interface. That's the model. And then we have the use cases. So in clean architecture, you need to create a use, a, a use case for every action. So for example, here we have delete post, new post, show post, show post. So let's start with uh, show post. Uh, in clean architecture, you might end up with a lot of files, creating a lot of files, uh, interfaces, uh, but that's going to make it later on cleaner. And for any new developers joining your project, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it e easier for him to understand it and read the code easily. So here we uh, define an interface for show post interactor. Uh, it has only one function. Uh, get boss, it will return to us a promise of an array of uh, post entities. And then we have uh, the implementation, and in my case, I call it default. So here the implementation. So the interactor expecting, um, uh, expecting the gateway to be injected in the constructor, and then the function will uh, uh, the gate post will use uh, the gateway. So here, typically, uh, since our demo is so simple, there was no logic added here. But usually, all the logic, all the business logic will be added in here before you trigger the gateway or after you trigger the gateway. So any logic the application has, let's say filtering, you adding sorting, you add, you add uh, some mapping, you add it in here. So that's the use case. Use case is simple, clean. I have a one gateway. The gateway will be injected. And then all I'm going to do is just return uh, the gateway function called fetch post. So let's go to the, uh, the data layer. The data layer has a lot of layers here. First of all, we have the adapters. Adapters, uh, we, as we mentioned before, is the state management. So in my case here, I'm using uh, uh, Mobix state tree, uh, which is, for me it's cleaner and much easier to implement than Redux, personal opinion. Uh, 
So let's, let's go to the gateways and see how. So the gateways, here you can implement multiple gateways. In project A, uh, we have implemented around four gateways. Gateways would represent a source uh, of data. For example, if you are implementing YouTube API, you can add YouTube um, gateway. Uh, it's going to be a separate folder, a separate implementation than others. So in here, we have uh, the first of all, we have the interface. So the interface here directly will not uh, implement any. It will only extend the remote data provider. So this data actually coming from the remote. So the remote, again, here we have all the functionalities exactly the same. You call the function fetch post. It will return to you a promise of a, an array of post entities. And, and then in the default, and the default uh, data provider, here we have another injections happen, which is uh, number one, we have the environment being injected. Number two, we have the network layer. So, and then here in the function itself, I'm going to return uh, the network layer in requesting, uh, requesting uh, the input for fetching a uh, fetch post. So in here, uh, in the default uh, demo gateway, again, I'm uh, injecting a remote data provider and the local data provider. And then let's say, um, in this case, because I'm only using a remote, in here you can add the logic to uh, determine where the data are coming from. For example, um, you can, Add here um, an F. If this data been cached in the DB or local storage, you can return it from the local storage. No need to call the remote. So here, where you can add your uh, data source logic, I would say, yeah, you can add it in the gateways. Um, so uh, there are some other layers here. For example, here you can create uh, your services. Uh, you can hear the common. For example. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Inversify GS, where you do all the injection, you add it all in one container, and it will just handle everything for you for the injection. Uh, so let's go to the presentation layer, which is the UI. So in the UI, we have uh, the screens. Let's go to the home, the container, the smart component. Smart component knows, knows about the state, uh, a trigger, the Mobex uh, store, it triggered the store, the store will return the data to me and to the screen, to the dump component, the dump component directly will expect all the data are coming and then it will render it. So a lot of files being created, uh, as you can see, a lot of folders being created. Uh, for small projects, I would say maybe you avoid it, but if you're going for, let's say, Project A, a big project, you're working with uh, eight, like five plus developers, you, you might need to consider it. So, um, yeah, uh, this is the example. Yeah, uh, simple, nothing special. Q&A. Okay, no questions. That's good. Uh, you can read. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, as uh, okay, I'm coming from a mobile uh, development background, so coming from Swift, the cleanest for me. Uh, c coming to JavaScript, it was a nightmare. Uh, I, I was, I was, uh, I tried to use fl uh, Flow. Yeah, I'll try to use it for a while, but when, but the moment, uh, like I get to know uh, TypeScript, uh, I'm not starting any project. Uh, actually, forcing it in the company. No starting project in JavaScript, but you can start in TypeScript only. Once you go TypeScript, you never go back. Any other questions? Yes. No. Okay, so yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so 
The turbo Uncle Bob, yeah, clean architecture, yeah. The best architecture in yeah. the React and the React sector. Yes. So my question is, uh, how can you share your presentation later between the React and the architecture? Okay, good question. Uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> This is uh, the demo that I showed is supposed to be React React Native. Uh, uh, maybe to the next speech, uh, why not? Uh, I'm gonna show how to create a, uh, a shared, not only component, but shared logic uh, from experience. That's how we, we've done it. Uh, how to share all the logic, uh, the use cases. You share, we, like you, you can, I would say you can share almost 80% from native, to web. Uh, if you use styled component, uh, I would say you can go to 90%. Yeah, uh, for the presentation, actually, you can check. Uh, there is a, a library from, uh, no, a library called styled component which uh, they solved this issue where you can share an actual component from React to React Native. But I would not recommend that, uh, but if you wanna share that layer, the presentation layer, uh, there have been solutions out there. Style component and React Native web. Yeah. Hi, what's, what's Uncle Bob architecture? <laughs> Uncle Bob ar architecture. Okay, it's, okay, from my perspective, it's, you simplified your application. You create, you create. Um, it's a guideline to create uh, like a layered architecture application. So, for example, like each layer, you like as a developer coming from let's say clean Swift or uh, clean Android, you know exactly what this layer do. It's easy later on in the unit test. You can cover up to 80, 90 percent. Uh, debugging is way much easier. Implementing new uh, endpoints, let's say if you were dealing with a big project, a new endpoint, it's way much easier. Uh, okay, <clears throat> another announcement. Uh, I'm going to share this project, but uh, maybe by next week, uh, this project is going to be shared with the React Native project. I'll share them in the GitHub so everyone can access the code and have a look at it. Uh, any questions? Uh, any feedbacks because to be honest like we all here to learn and of course I might miss something in here so you can reach me out at at gorhom at uh, github and anytime thank you well so uh, first of all we have uh, we're gonna talk about angular at scale and second talk is react at scale so uh, since we are all going through this framework thing, man, maybe you can do a poll like, who's doing React? Who's, who here uses React? Right? Okay. React forever, man. Uh, okay, <laughs> go. Uh, <laughs> Angular. Angular. How many people you use Angular? Are you going to move around? It's pretty strong, huh? Uh, uh, if I'm going to move around, just wait. Yeah, okay. The line, line. You. <laughs> me, you, me, you, me. You. Okay, how about none of these three? Wow. How about web components? <laughs> oh. oh man, okay. Um, all right. You need to be buff up on web components. So uh, next up we have uh, Steven. Steven is uh, one of the co-organizers for KLJS. In fact, he's super instrumental in tonight happening right here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he will be speaking on Flutter versus React Native. Oh. Um, <laughs> So it's like a continuation of previous talk. Um, right. <laughs> so go on to mention Flutter and Steven's trying to bring the comparison to you. Um, so take it away, Steven. Let's All give right. him a hand. All right. Thank you, Anton. All right. So basically, like, I'm going to talk about React Native, which is uh, Flutter. So there's always going to be an argument and a fight over there. Uh, React Native is better, Flutter is better, maybe phone gap is better. but is it really that good? So I just had basically like we have uh we have an eye, Stephen Raj, 
And uh, what's the co-organizer with, together with uh, Jonathan for Quarrel Project S and organized the Ruby conference uh, recently. I hope I had a very good feedback about the uh, Ruby conference and thanks to the sponsors and everyone. And I'm a Ruby guy, but and then I saw Go and like I went to a GoPacon in Singapore and I'm like, oh, this thing is really good. So I start to do Go more often now and like so far I'm loving it. So and also happen to code in JavaScript mainly for like front end part. So let's get a full stack. So I just want to like shout out for Ruby conference for especially for the sponsors, Gojack, uh, they were like very helpful for us. And CoinGecko and uh Kaudin Chento and Rapid River, Sura Labs, Tweezo, which I did my value as well. So without them and like we had like a two days conference and we like uh more than twenty speakers worldwide. So it was like really like we had a like two hundred and thirty attendees. So the feedback was really great. Uh so thank you so much for that. And moving on to the topic, the fight, React Native versus Flutter. So I'm not going to talk about phone gap, Ioni, Kotlin, or SSR <laughs> because I'm not a fan of it. I never tried it before. So, and it's always like, is it a Facebook is Google fight? So React Native is from Facebook and Flutter is from Google. And to be honest, Google is trying to like, okay, be challenged by Facebook, I guess, with React Native. And it's also a, a, a language fight, I guess, well, like JavaScript against Dart. So people with JavaScript stick with JavaScript. So maybe I can try to move KOJS to like that <laughs> something. <laughs> oh, and A and B actually dumped uh, React Native recently, like, but they had their own reason because of their, mo ma mainly, mainly because of their architecture, I guess. So, and, but it's understandable. Oh, I just stick with native, like using higher two people for Android and like another for iOS. But the fight, I think is going to continue forever. So talking about it. So React Native just came like, they had a, a fifth birthday for uh, since open source recently. They took the world by storm, and it's by Facebook. But do we still trust Facebook? though? No. it's like we're having a lot of issue with Facebook recently. Like, uh, privacy and data. Like, it's like a lot of it. and is it like really open source? They have we have to like actually fight for it to even get a patent and like a uh, licensing issue with it. But the good thing about Reddit is like it's getting very matured and like it's have an impressive like user interface and like. Uh, user experience and to be honest when I'm using it it's pretty easy to use like all the libraries and like a lot of people are contributing it and like a lot of libraries to use but I still face some issue with that like, navigation or like uh, your geocoding and stuff so but it's basically like reality of hierarchy of UI components it's basically everything is components so and most of the time now no one like using HTML CSS like they're using React JS now so and if you're using React Native and your front end is React JS, it's like it's useful as well. So that's one of the advantage of React Native, I guess. So, but it also has components for both iOS and Android. With obviously the the feel should be native and the, the look should be native as well. But is it really look and the feel is really native compared to like using a Swift and Astra? But React Native apps are compiled to native written code, so compilation is happening there. But is it really fast? Are you feeling the performance and stuff? So for React Native, how it works is like this case is similar as uh Flutter React reactive uh, frameworks. You have a bridge in the middle, basically between the JavaScript, the code, and like uh with the platform and for the events and the canvas uh, for the front end part. And the bridge is, is like asynchronous, so it basically have, enables the communication and so it's serializable. So it's always communicating uh, here and there, but how efficient is it? How performance wise is like, it's really good or not? Well, obviously, it's like both is using just one language, Flutter and uh, React Native, JavaScript, and now it's that. But, and it's also like time saving. Uh, before going to time saving, like, you can reuse the component and it's like really easy to maintain, but is it really time saving? Sometimes you spend most of the time like bug fixing it, so. Because like a lot of issues and like a lot of contribution, like it's still like people like trying to figure out a way. But as I said earlier, like it's easier if you're using React Jets for the front end part. So you just have most of the code is there already. So you just have to like make it work for you. So and but is it really that good? So usually like using uh, if you look at domain it's like using S4, but some people still like especially like I'm still using like create a, a create native app um for the 
instead of expo in it so it's just still like some people like, like to use expo and like some people like to use the creative but personally i feel like expo is like a bit bolted and it's like it's quite big for simple things sometimes you want to do so yeah performance still questionable but overall it's still okay i mean like it's better than like what they have compared to like ionic or phone gap or security issues and license and patent issues and it's by facebook so i don't i'm not a fan of facebook but you know should know uh, by now but but it's, to be honest like facebook like they can like uh just stop anytime they want to take away it so it's very uncertain it's but the same can be said to that as well with the platter like is it really like going to be there forever and the constant update is, sometimes can be annoying but i understand they want to improve it and like make it better but it's always breaks so it's a bit annoying as well so and how many people are a fan of redux though so like, some people hate the redux so is it really helpful and recently we had this like npm package with like two thousand two million weekly dollars and malicious code injected and no one knows what the malicious code does yet but by now they know already the guy like came out and saying i was thinking it's credit card numbers and password from your side it's just because they had a lot of dependency depending on that so like it's more than one thousand how you want to maintain that so it's like if your ruby is like it's, it's more like to maintain by a few people i mean uh co committers like it's maintained by managed well but but this is like open source anyone can just contribute it and start take over it but here comes the platter so it's gained like by google and it's like the popularity is increasing very very uh, rapidly and this is that so this is a roadblock because of like that what's the that is like new programming language and to be honest i was only figuring out what it is like two weeks ago so but i start to like it so the way it works and stuff and mainly it's based on widgets and you can build a large web of it that but that's not a good idea or it's performed very bad and there's a recently like started studio i just it's not even complete yet but I just check it out but faster studio is more like a drag and drop kind of thing i don't think it's going to be a big thing but yeah but it's yeah people are trying to make change like make Flutter like enjoyable and like usable and the main goal is like actually for Flutter is building high performance like high fidelity app for ios android from a single code base which sounds like similar like red native and a lot of people have like uh actually liking it for the performance issue but how it works like you write once you can deploy to five instead of like just ios android you can use it for uh windows like mac as well so and it's its own graphic to hardware which is like scale engine like which is similar to the one power chrome i don't know how true is it they say so so i believe so so and it uses a native AR binary this itself helps a lot in terms of performance it's compiled ahead of time so you doesn't need like a jvm as well as like and it's how it looks like so it doesn't have the bridging at all in the middle it's straight away connect to the canvas and like it saves a lot of time communication wise and it's compiled ahead of time so it doesn't have to like compile later or a delayed performance wise and the graphic is like you have it's basically the widgets are similar like uh uh it copies the ios or the android similar wise it's not using the widgets from the others uh, i mean the from the uh uh like red natives you have to use the different break so yeah but why is it so good yep for the the engine itself because it's compiled to the binary and language wise that i wouldn't be like it's, it's a bit tricky at first i i would put it as a between like javascript and java in the, right in the middle so it's more like they say some people say it's more like a shoe shop but i feel like right in the middle sometimes i feel like it's java and i'm not a fan of java so it's a bit tricky so but what i like about it is the performance wise that's the that's the main reason like why i'm was, was like, trying to figure out why it was so good about this platter and and the widgets are like uh look exactly like the top oem widget so it just it sounds like it the widget i mean the similar like oem but yeah it's not oem and the codes are actually less so 
I will show later that for simple hello world was like less like half something like that and it's custom and like a lot of widgets if you, if you need your own widgets it can, you can build your own widget as well and it's pretty easy to do that uh, they have a very documented docu <coughs> documentation out there and the best part is it gives the developer complete control over the system so red anything is like very sometimes a bit hard because it's not native but with this because it's just copying the for the canvas wise uh, you can actually build your own and it's already for now is they have for Android mature design and for Apple iOS Cupertino but for iOS I doubt it actually is like bug free so because it's Google anyway so <laughs> they hate iOS so and, and, and I was trying with iOS it was like a bit buggy as well so but is it really that good it's really still very new it's not even for product like 1.0 yet it's still like preview release preview 2 version they just now so I not think it's production ready yet and it's always have issues with iOS that's why I, I figured out when I was like looking at the forums and readings so, like sometimes they have uh, some simple minor issues that like, it takes forever to fix that so the main is just, like web uh, web wise like react native have a react js for that it's very slow it's not even recommended but uh, to use it on the web so and the compilation could be excessive as well sometimes. And this is the file structure for it. And it's pretty straightforward. So basically, you start with the main dot file, that's where it's everything started. So and you can straight away like start code over from there. And the question of similarities with the React Native and like that and or Flutter, I mean. So Basically, both uses a uh, re reactive uh, development architecture, but it has a twist. Just that React Native have a bridge, and this doesn't have a bridge. The syntax is almost similar sometimes, so I feel like sometimes like okay, this still like JavaScript, bit, but it's not like it's still it's just like mystery of Java and JavaScript. But the good thing is they have a very well documented like GoLang is like a uh, Go that have a very good documentation, and this is like similar as well. We have a very good documentation and community behind this is very strong as well as far as so far I'm using it there's always somewhere I can find solution for it so and they're always helpful so that's the best part of it and uh, another uh, similarity is the hot reloading so with uh, Red Native they have a hot reloading but it's not that efficient but with this platter it's like instantly like less than like two seconds there like you can like see the changes that are happening right as you make the changes it's just because of it's like compiling ahead of time but it's not production ready yet though so i don't know where they're going to be and it's the question of like can we trust them like facebook and google it's like two giants out there like they're trying to make money and like market share but are we going to uh, like trust them because anytime they can like just stop it like google they always stop or whatever they want and like just get rid of like doesn't care what happened to us and the file size so this case like for the hell world i was like for flutter is like 4.7 mb it's like uh, for React Native it's like around 7 MB, but it's still quite big compared to like the native like even Kotlin like and Java like 550 KB, so it's like huge difference there. Like it's a long way to go, and like but it's still better than like less than React Native. So I feel like sometimes like it's just a fight. It's Google trying to do is like fight against face uh, Facebook React Native. And hello world, this is a code for I mean React Native like it's like. Yeah, so this is for for reactive. So hello world class extend the rep the component and implement the random method by retaining a view component. And this is like you feel like it's okay, but this is like less with the flutter. So using just a center text widget from the core widget, and it just has one child above which is called a text widget, and you just put a hello world in there. And for documentation wise, it's like you just go to flutter.io, everything is there. That's what that's what I was like looking at it. Hmm. It's like it's a similar thing. It's like everything is if you're coming for Red Native, it's there. If you're coming for iOS stuff, it's there. They, they are like telling you step by step, like how you learn, like ABC, I feel like. <laughs> so um and also the community on the other side is the gitter.io platter. It's very active, you can just sign in, it's always active there. You can just anything, people will come and help you. It's like that's how they maintain it. Even if like you go to platter.io there's always like two main things documentation and like committee which is that 
anything is behind the language to try. And what next? And React Native is now, but but it's the future. But is it true? I do have no idea. You have to wait. We be like, <laughs> how many people are straight up with like React Native? Yeah. So Flutter is not now. I don't believe it's now. So there's a lot of things go on. So it's not even production ready yet. Uh, they still figure out when to launch 1.0. I'm like, yeah. It's not even 1.0 yet. It's just like live preview at the moment. Yeah. But if you can try it out, I just try it out like two weeks. It's quite easy to pick up everything. Just the only roadblock is still is the programming language for uh, the Dart. So because I'm not a uh, Java background, so it's a bit hard to actually do that tricky bit. So other than that, it's very good. So I mean, I feel like you can try it out, give it a try for that. But, uh, and that's about it. All right, we have time for questions. I hope not. <laughs> You respect everyone's views. <laughs> yep. And yes, yes, of course. <laughs> everyone wants to yeah, see. I don't. I don't cognize over that. <laughs> yeah, and this is for the testing. So they have a testing as well for unit testing and widget testing. They have a full complete testing for it. For some rare native, we don't even do testing. So <laughs> to be honest, so yeah. <laughs> but they are providing it. So when you create the first Flutter app. It comes with the testing included into it, so you have to remove it if you don't want it. And for the okay, I thought, oops, okay, <laughs> okay. So I tried a Flutter, I think four months ago. Okay, it was once in beta release. Uh, there was no package manager. There was no third, yep. uh, third party uh, library. Yep. Is it still the same? And if again for the future. Like, uh, will they be using GS libraries or how it works with that? Okay, for third party libraries, yes, it's true. Like, it's still lacking, but it's much better than compared to like four months ago. So, a lot of changes. So, if the new one, the preview, you can check it out. It's, uh, they have a lot like widgets and stuff. So, one of the other stuff you can check out is like, uh, yeah, this is like where you compile everything. So, for the SDK, for the performance, I mean, like for the uh, all the widgets or like components and stuff, UI. Yeah. As example, as example, see a portion and a single project. Uh, I work on it. I, I just started two weeks ago. So okay. yeah. So we had. Another question. I still look great anyway, by the way, so yeah. I'm probably gonna rename the group to KL Dart. No. So uh, just to be clear, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> yes, does not support Facebook or Google. Or yeah. We're not sponsored by any of them. So we have, we have freedom to say whatever we want. Yeah. <laughs> All right, question in the back. Uh, I just have a question for. Uh, 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 so I think the React Native has already updates, right? And Flutter has so mistaken. Can you repeat again? Uh, over the air updates. Oh, React Native has over the air updates. Okay, this one they have as well. Uh, you can use the fast link for deployment part. And let me check. So yeah. So, okay. So you can do it with fast lane as well. So for for React Native, oh, I was okay. using fast lane as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I have the same one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's like Expo. Yeah, I think it's similar like Expo, but this is better than Expo. It's not as bolted as Expo. So. Yes, I feel like its performance was like really good, but if you want, it's not ready yet for production, so I wouldn't be using for production. But the recently Google AdWords app is using this, so and Alibaba is using it as well. So if I go to the Flutter, yeah, they have a lot. <laughs> they just do much free time, I guess. So, uh, yeah. So see what's been created. 
Alibaba is there. So Google is only using for Google Ads, if not mistaken, Google AdWords app. And yeah, Tencent is using it. So and JD Finance, so it's like China. So okay, so I guess that's about it. Alright, let's give my hand yeah. to Steven. Okay, uh, I think that uh, that's a good summary of comparison. Um, you know, feel free to uh, rebut the next time, uh, give another talk, you know. Um, so this will be most likely the last meet of the year. And uh, fingers crossed, we'll be back in January. Um, and it's a lazy February. Yeah, okay, so, we'll see. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming thing here all the way. It's uh, <laughs> awesome to see a big crowd here.